Good morning. Nice uh, little little uh, chilly morning compared to the last uh, few days, but I uh, hope everyone's uh, faring okay. Uh, welcome to the uh, final day of our Dairy Forage uh, seminar series, and we've got a great one to start off this morning. I, my name is Dennis Hancock. I get to be the center director at the Dairy Forage Research Center. Uh, our research center is part of the USDA ARS, the Ag Research Service. Uh, we have locations, uh, two research units in Madison, and then we also have a research unit up in Marshfield. And it turns out that Matt actually is, is co-housed in our uh, unit there in Marshfield, works very closely with our team uh, in that unit. Uh, our first speaker this morning is Matt Akins. Uh, Matt is a, a, a researcher and extension specialist up at uh, Marshfield for UW. And they have been working, he and several members of the team have been working on some of these alternative grasses, alternative forages, um, and, and talking about uh, how they're going to fit into the dairy system. And so this morning, We've invited Matt to kind of summarize some of their work and, and to share feeding grass, alternative species, and cover crops for higher production. So Matt, thank you. All right, can you hear me? All right. Never know with these microphones, so. All right. Uh, maybe, maybe that'd be better. All right, thank you, Dennis. So it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. It's been a couple years since I've been down here. Don't always make the trip down from Marshfield. So I'm busy, busy with plot work right now um, the last few weeks. So I'm trying to finish those up before it uh, starts freezing up there. Um, but yeah, yeah, today, so we're going to be going through some of our recent work with um, use of grasses and um, alternative forages in uh, dairy uh, cattle diets, so lactating and, and heifer diets. Um, and I think at, we'll save the questions until the end, so, but um, we'll try to get through this in about 30, 40 minutes, and then uh, if you have questions, we can try to address those. So, so first, just go through a little bit on utility, how, we, how these might fit, the kind of advantages of grasses and uh, alternative forages, kind of yield and quality that you might expect. Uh, from these in, in the field, um, and then maybe where these, where these fit, where we found opportunities in the dairy cow's diets. So we're, based on our work, uh, we feel that these forages, these grasses and alternative forages, have pretty reasonable yields compared to uh, traditional alfalfa or alfalfa grass mixes. Um, the one really nice thing that we see for these is that it allows in-season manure. Um, so during the summer, we see that as an advantage to be able to go in, take those off, and then putting manure right in behind those. So then that leaves you not in a bind like right now after uh, corn silage is finished and having to uh, empty those pits out. So then you're having to, uh, it's a little less of a stress in the fall season and cleaning out pits before the winter season. Uh, also, you're going to be using those nutrients a little bit more effectively on those growing crops as well. Um, with the grass species, compared to alfalfa, we've seen, obviously, the, the grasses have a little bit better fiber digestibility, so that's another advantage, especially in, in the lactating cow diets um, that we've seen. Um, as far as cover crops, these have been really useful as far as soil cover through winter. Um, you can see here, these are some pictures from uh, Kevin Shelley in the middle where they've put in rye and then that's the, that provides some cover through the, through the fall and uh, through winter to help hold that soil in place. Um, so they've had, we've had really good success with that, with those, those cereal grain cover crops and, and uh, protecting that soil. And the other thing with these cover crops, especially <coughs> cereal grains and some of these warm season annual mixes or cocktail mixes, is you can uh, opens up opportunities for double cropping. So you can put those cereal grains uh, in in the fall, take them off in the spring, and then you got that opportunity to put a, a warm season annual or cocktail mix in and after that. 
So you can get a double cropping opportunity even in uh, even Wisconsin. So. <coughs> So first off, I'm going to go through some of our data that we have from Marshfield as far as well for grasses. So we'll go through some of our grass work, and then we'll go through some of the more of the uh, sorghum sedan work, sorghum forage work, and then we'll go through some of the cocktail mix, and then get into some of the feeding uh, uh, studies that we've done. So most of this work with grasses is done by Jason Cavadini up in Marshfield. So if you're not familiar with him, He'd be a really good guy to, to, um, to get in touch with or to work with about uh, growing perennial grasses. He's been doing this for the last three or four years, evaluating different varieties in plots. And so he's got a good handle on um, perennial grass yield and, and quality, um, at least in central Wisconsin. So he's been working with these uh, different varieties of grass compared to alfalfa. Uh, for the last three or four years. Um, as far as yield goes, and this is in a, a four or five cut system is what he's trying to target, so dairy quality uh, grasses. We've been getting about five to six tons of dry matter off these plots per year um, in a four or five cut system. The one key to consider in this is he is applying nitrogen after each cutting, so 40 pounds of nitrogen. If you want any, it's, that's really critical with these grasses is they require nitrogen fertil fertilization, whether that's from manure or from uh, commercial fertilizers. Uh, grasses are gonna, they're not gonna take up nitrogen from the soils like legumes, so you're gonna have to really, uh, you're gonna have to feed those grasses to really get yield uh, of these. Um, so that's something to consider is, do you have enough manure to be able to do that or you're gonna have to end up uh, purchasing fertilizer for that, and then figuring out is that going to pay for itself. But we've, we've gotten pretty good yields as far as uh, this goes, the, the five cut system in uh, 2021 um, across several different species. Um, what we did notice is with the metal fescues, we generally had a little bit less yield compared to the others. Um, but that's something just to consider. Uh, we generally do see a little bit better fiber digestibility with those fescues though. So um, that's something we sacrifice a little bit of yield for a little bit better quality in those. Moving on to quality of these perennial grasses in that same year. Um, so looking at the blue bars or the NDF digestibility compared to alfalfa. You can see across the five cuttings, we consistently had a, a slightly higher fiber digestibility, about three to 4% higher fiber digestibility compared to alfalfa. Uh, so ranged about 67 to 70% typically. Um, one thing to consider is this alfalfa over, over by that third year was about half grass or even greater amount of grass in that where the alfalfa had winter killed and had filled, filled in with some uh, grass that was in the soil, grass seed. But we do, again, pick up some improved fiber digestibility. But we, as you can see, the protein levels are a little bit lower than the alfalfa, about two points lower, even with that 40 pounds of N applied at each cutting. So we generally see a little bit lower nitrogen in those grasses than compared to alfalfa. And this was a pretty, in, uh, it was in super intense cutting schedule, so every about 35 days in that, in that year, so not a super intense cutting schedule compared to um, an alfalfa schedule where it's every, maybe f every 28 to 30 days. So. The one thing to consider with grasses is that first cutting is gonna be quite a bit different than with your subsequent cuttings because of the, as that, plant is maturing early in the spring, it's elongating, so you're gonna generally have higher fiber values and lower digestibilities because of that. So that's something to consider. So if you can see in this first cutting, relative forage quality was only about 140 to 160, while in that second cutting and, and the later ones was about 160 to 180. 
so we generally see our higher um, quality in those later cuttings because you have less stem. You have mostly leaf material. So that's something to consider. So you might say, maybe we're going to do that first cutting for, uh, for heifer feed and then subsequent cuttings for lactating cow feed. So that's something to consider is how we want to differentiate those cuttings and what animal groups those would go to. But it's just based on the, how that plant matures throughout the season, so. Which actually can be pretty convenient because those later cuttings are changing more slowly. Because those later cuttings, so this is some work done by Jeff Brink at, at uh, US Dairy Forage Center. So you can see in this first cutting, the fiber data stability declines pretty quickly because that's maturing over time more, more quickly in the spring. Compared to this second and third cutting, they're maturing the, it's basically leaf material, it's not heading out. So then you have uh, the, the fiber data stability and the fiber content change more slowly. So it, over time, it's not as critical to maybe hit your targets right on. You can delay cutting a day or two and you're not gonna have a big hit on quality um, if you have to delay due to the weather concerns. So, so that's, that's a convenient thing with grass is that the, the, they don't change as, uh, as quickly due to maturity. So next we're gonna move on to Italian ryegrass. So is anybody in here growing Italian ryegrass? There's a few, I know Kevin is, he's got it in plots, but this is one thing that, that Jason has been seeing being used quite a bit, at least in our, in the central Wisconsin area. Um, Cause as we've seen more winter kill of alfalfa, we've, there's some dairies that have gone uh, pretty heavily into Italian ryegrass as a replacement. Um, so we, that was something we were interested in looking at what, what's the yield and quality that we would see of, of this Italian ryegrass. So he's been looking at this the last three years. And what he was, he was most interested in was the nitri nitrogen fertility. So we had set up plots with, with no fertilization, with manure, and that, and that incremental rates of, of uh, nitrogen. And, and Kevin's got some data that he'll show this afternoon, I'm sure, on this as well. But after about 30 to 60 pounds of N, we don't see a huge increase. The main increase is from that, where we have no fertility up to about 30 to 60. We get a small bump up to 90 to 120 pounds per acre, but this is per cutting, so not per year. So if, I can't imagine putting 120 pounds of nitrogen on every cutting for five cuttings and being able to pay for that. It is, it'd be a very expensive amount of fertilizer to, to put on that and only get another uh, one ton of forage for an extra 60 pounds of nitrogen per cutting. It just doesn't pay as far as forage yield or quality really. Um, so basically we're finding out about four to five tons per acre is typically what we're gonna see in a five cutting system or actually a, a four cutting system, in, at least in Marshfield. Um, it, it's highly dependent upon soil conditions too. Uh, if you have a very dry year, Italian ryegrass is gonna take a big hit. Um, if you have a, a wetter year, it does really ex pretty exceptionally well. So if you run into a drought situation, uh, your yields are probably gonna be uh, pretty, pretty low because it does need quite a bit of moisture for growth. Um, when we look at the yields um, by harvest, most of it, a lot of it came in the first cutting, about one and a half tons of dry matter in the first cutting, about 0.8 in the second and third, and then the last two, about a half ton. In my mind, if I was to, to harvest, I would not do that, that last cutting, and I would delay that fourth cutting a little bit to try to make up for that, maybe delay it a, a week or two to try to avoid that last cutting, because we're probably not really pay, even paying for that equipment cost and fuel cost to even drive over the field for that. So I would probably do a four cut system and maybe delay that a week or two to try to get that additional yield, so in my mind. But what producers really like about Italian ryegrass is the quality. 
if we look at the NDF data stability, we're, we can hit NDF data stabilities of 65 to 70 percent pretty easily with this stuff. It's all leaf material, uh, very little stem, uh, if any. Uh, so very consistently high fiber data stabilities, uh, low UNDF, so nutritionists really like feeding this stuff, um, and pretty consistently pretty good uh, forage quality across uh, with these forages. But we do see an impact of nitrogen fertility on these. Um, you can see um, on average, this is the gray bar. We do see an incremental increase with fertility. Um, if we were to put about 30 to 60 pounds of nitrogen, we probably would expect about 16% average. But again, big differences between cuts, where we had a really high yielding uh, crop in that first harvest is about 12 to 15 percent. By the last cutting where it's very low yields, it's only, it's 20 to 25 percent. So it's a big dilution effect going on there of that, that material. But typically, like 15 to 16 percent is probably about average what you'd expect across all of the, all those harvests. So a good a decent protein, but the fiber data stability is really where we're focused on with with this uh, tine ryegrass is high fiber data stability is what producers really like, like in this, this forage. So next we're gonna move on to some cover crop work that uh, Wayne Koblenz had done um, in the, the mid 2016, 2017 that uh, pretty, pretty nice work. Um, so this is a, a two year study that he did and it, it shows the variation that we can see in these cereal grain forages. This is in triticale. So this is, um, so it's planted in, in the fall uh, and then harvested in the spring. And you can see 2016, we had really good conditions, growing conditions, decent, wasn't too wet, uh, good heat units coming in. Um, and we had good yields. So by boot stage, we had accumulated about 3,000 pounds of dry matter, and it continued to increase. By soft dose stage, we were up to five to six tons of dry matter of that, that forage, so exceptional yields in 2016. If we look at 2017, really wet, cold spring, um, we had barely reached 1,500 pounds by boot stage, and by soft dough, we weren't even, we were at around two tons. So you could just tell the difference between two years with identical management, fertility, uh, just difference in weather patterns and how that affects these cereal grain forages. So not always gonna be consistent every year on what your yields will be. So that's something to consider. Um, so weather will play a, an impact. And there's lots of other factors with that too. Uh, when you plant it in the fall, is a big factor, so the earlier you get it in, the better usually in the spring. So there's, there's different factors to consider with these cereal forages and what, what impacts. But, um, but usually for lactating cows, we generally say about boot stage for uh, harvest and then heading to anthesis for heifers usually. Um, And the reason for that is if we start looking at the fiber content, uh, it, it's right around uh, 40 to 45%, about 45 to 50% for boot stage. If we start delaying that too far for lactating cows, it just gets too much fiber. And at 45, that boot stage at 50% fiber, it's still got good good fiber data stability in it. That fiber hasn't lignified very much yet, so it's good quality fiber. If we let that go too far, it's really gonna turn into heifer feed, which is actually a really good quality heifer feed, high fiber uh, forage that fits well into to heifer diet. So, um, so the feed's pretty versatile, whether you get in there sooner uh, to get it for lactating cow feed or you let it go for a little bit longer and it turns into heifer feed. So, but it, it's a fairly versatile uh, crop, but really need to 
to make sure that you know what you want to feed those to, whether if you're targeting cows, you're going to want to get in there early. If you were, need heifer feed, let it go a little bit longer, let it head out. Uh, one thing to consider with this is if you let it go to soft dough, those stems will become fairly hollow and it becomes a bit difficult to pack. So that's one thing to consider is uh, packing can be a, a difficult thing with these cereal grain forages. Once they um, elongate and get hollow stems, they get to be really a hassle to get it packed and they dry down fairly, fairly quickly in the field. So you probably want to probably target this range if you're looking for heifer feed before they become hollow stems. So. All right, so moving on to sorghums. Trying to keep on time here, cruising through. So, so one thing I've been, one reason I've been interested in sorghums the last five, six years is mainly for heifer feed. Um, trying to get some high fiber feed for um, controlling feed intakes. But what I've found is that these can also be uh, sources of lactating cow feeds as well, um, if we manage it correctly. So if we want lactating cow sorghum forage in Wisconsin, I probably would recommend going with like a BMR sorghum Sudan grass or a Sudan grass, and then using a multiple cut system is probably the way to go if you're looking for lactating cow feed uh, from this type of forage. Mainly, you're getting similar to the, like the ryegrass. You're looking for high, high uh, fiber diet stability is the main thing. You're looking for energy from the fiber. Um, and these are just some kind of a schematic of what we use for the, the process in Wisconsin. So we typically are planting that in early to mid-June. Usually that's going to be happening after a cereal grain harvest. That's really good situation. So taking off that uh, spring crop and then putting that direct seeding that into that, that, uh, that, um, into that crop after you harvest and probably put some manure down. And then that first cutting usually come in about 40 to 45 days post seeding. Generally, you're going to be targeting about 30 to 36 inches, maybe 40 inches height. The one thing to consider is you don't want to take this too late. If you push that back too late in the mid, into early to mid August for that first cutting, that doesn't leave enough days of growth for that second cutting. Because in Wisconsin, by mid-August, our days are really getting shorter. Uh, heat units are getting short. So you really need to probably target that late July, early August to be able to get another crop off in the, in the fall. So take that off in late July and then come in with that second cutting in either mid-September where you cut and wilt that or you let that get fr frozen and then harvest that directly off, cut it and, and chop it off. Obviously, if you let it freeze and, and then cut it, you're going to have a lot lower protein values, but it's going to be dried down fairly right where it needs to be at 30 to 40 percent dry matter if you let it freeze and let it sit for a week. Generally, we don't have to worry too much about prussic acid if you let those leaves dry completely down. The, uh, that'll volatize off. Plus, you're going to let it, if you ferment it too, that'll help to uh, eliminate that uh, toxin issue. If you're looking for mostly heifer feed, a single crop system probably is more adapt, more uh, going to be provide you that forage quality that you're looking for. You're looking for high fiber levels that are with lower digestibility. Um, plus, your yields are going to be probably about one and a half to two times higher than with the multi-cut system. So that's another advantage is your yield, yields are going to be quite a bit, bit higher. Um, if you want to use forage sorghum, this would probably be the main option you would use anyways because you're probably looking for maybe a little bit of grain uh, development as well. Um, one thing to consider is the type of variety that you use. So there's some uh, some new varieties that have a photosensitive trait. So those will not become reproductive until the daylight is less than about 12 and a half hours a day. So that's in about mid-September. 
So there's no signal for that plant to start drying down. Uh, so you have to wait for a frost for that, if you want that to, to dry down naturally. Otherwise, you're gonna have to cut and wilt that stuff to get it down to the moisture for harvesting. Um, just one thing to consider when you're selecting those. Um, so what we've used our system is to plant in early to mid-June, and then as far as harvesting, some dairies are now starting to do a, a mid-late, mid-September, uh, late-September cut when you get some good drying weather, like we had in mid-late September where it's 70, 80 degrees, good drying conditions. Cut that, let it sit for two or three days, and then come back and chop that, chop that off. And then they don't have to worry about freeze drying, which if anybody has any thoughts back to 2019 where people were putting in prevent plant sorghum sedan and then trying to get it off in the middle of winter, that was a, a disaster for some, some producers trying to get that stuff off. Um, so that, this just eliminates some of that risk of letting it freeze dry and then having lodging issues later on. Because there is some risk as if you let that freeze dry and you get a hard wind or snow, that stuff will lodge pretty quick if you have a good snowfall on it, just from ex personal experience too. So. Uh, we've, we've seen that in plots in, in large fields at, up in Marshfield. But this can work, especially right now, we're going like uh, to have a freeze probably uh, tonight. We've had fro frosts, heavy frosts last week where it's enough to kill the leaves. You get leaf material that's dry, that even with the, the stems are going to be wet, that leaf material is enough to get the moisture down to that 30%. And then if you, let, if you extend your cutting length out to about an inch, that'll help with your seepage issues. Um, if you cut it short, short chop length, you're gonna have probably seepage issues if you don't, uh, if, if you uh, chop it when it's too wet. So if you wanna avoid the seepage issues, cut it longer. That'll definitely help out. So as far as yields, so on this left side, is our multiple cut system. So obviously corn doesn't work very good in a multi-cut system, it doesn't grow back very well. Um, but we did, we did it anyways just for, for the treatments. Uh, but you can see forage sorghum and the BMR forage sorghum and the conventional just don't do very well in a multi-cut system. Pretty low yields, uh, three and a half to four tons. Sorghum sedan grass is a really better suited um, for this, especially the conventional, we saw pretty good yields, at least in our plot work, of five to six tons of dry matter across two cuttings. Um, when we look at single harvest yields, we can, just in general, you can see a, compared to the multi-harvest, we're getting about one and a half to two times the yields, uh, getting more, just not, you don't have that regrowth time that you have to deal with. Um, but just between these, we do see a, a difference between conventional and BMR. So BMRs, we again, we see a little bit of a yield drag. Com typical, like what we see with B corn silage as well, we see a bit lower yields. But we also see a big effect of environment too. So the blue bars are in Hancock. That's in really sandy soils. Everything's irrigated. We can see really tremendous yield potential on those dry conditions. That, um, on more wetter soils, like in Marshfield, we see quite a bit lower yields of one to two tons less uh, uh, forage yields uh, compared to a, the drier, really ideal conditions for growing sorghum. So if you have dry soil conditions, sorghum sedan grass can work really well as a, a forage source. Um, but in general, for these single cut systems, we're, gonna, we're seeing six to eight tons of dry matter per acre. Um, in Marshfield, we generally see about five to six. In Hancock, we're seeing seven, eight, nine. We've seen up to 10 tons of dry matter on some pretty exceptional, well, during really good years, but probably about eight tons is our typical average in those drier soil conditions with irrigation and, and good nutrient. We typically put about 120 pounds of nitrogen uh, per acre on these sorghum sedan grass uh, single cut systems. So. Uh, 
as far as energy goes, you can see with the multi-cut system, we're getting fairly good energy, 62 to 67%. BMR obviously has a better energy values, better fiber data stability compared to the conventional, about three units increase in energy values. Uh, compared to the single harvest, we see a, a pretty good decline, so more fiber, less digestible fiber in that material. Um, so these are really ideal for heifer feeding. Again, these are more ideal for lactating cow feeding. Okay, so next we're going to move on to cocktail forage mixes. So we've done some work the last uh, two years with cocktail forage mixes. Uh, Kevin's been working with me on some of this over in Outagamie County, and he'll talk more about more of the fertility side of it later. Um, so these have become fairly popular, in especially the northeast part of the state and central Wisconsin. It's slowly coming on as well. But especially putting these in after cereal grain forage harvest, it's um, becoming more popular. Um, and what we were looking at was a, uh, in our plots, we had a mixture of sorghum sedan grass, who's a BMR type. Uh, we had Italian ryegrass. Uh, red and bursine clover and, and hairy vetch. So you got your grass components and then you have a legume component. So that's pretty typical with these cocktail mixes is to have that mixture. And ideally what we're trying to get is we're trying to get some nitrogen credits from those legumes. In theory we do, but if we look at plots in person with nitrogen applied to them, you don't see much of the legumes appear really at all throughout the, the period of our season, at least in our plots. Um, and same with, with Kevin's plots that I've seen as well. So you don't generally see a lot of the legumes come up, so I don't know what the actual nitrogen benefit or credit would be following uh, the following year. What the big thing that I do see an advantage is, is having this sorghum sedan grass and ryegrass together is that you get a a potential for three cutting three cuttings through the through the year uh, through the summer uh, because you can take two cuttings. This first cutting is in early August. Second cutting in early to mid September, about 30 to 35 days later, and then you can have an opportunity for another cutting in in early to mid October of that ryegrass. So it allows, it opens up that opportunity to, to get another cutting of really high quality lactating cow feed. Um, the one thing to consider is that these species change throughout the season. So your first cutting is gonna be mostly sorghum sedan. The next one's gonna be usually about a 50-50 mix of sorghum sedan and, and ryegrass. And by that third cutting, you're gonna see mostly ryegrass come in. So you're gonna have to figure out a way to manage that either you just put it into the pile and mix it in, which some people probably will do, or do you differentiate those and put it in bags or small piles and try to target feed that, that forage to certain groups? But this is just illustrating this, this change over time. Um, typical yields we see in our plots is about one and a half tons in the first cutting, uh, maybe one to one and a half in the second and about a half ton to one ton in that third cutting, depending upon the, um, the nitrogen that we uh, had available. And you'll see some pictures the next slide. These are some pictures from Okano County. Um, some really excellent uh, established fields over there. Some really nice uh, first cut of sorghum sedan grass. You can start to see a little bit of of the red clover and the vetch come in, but pretty minimal. But not really, not a lot of, not a lot of material down there of those legumes. You can see a little bit of ryegrass coming in too, but that sorghum sedan really shades out those other small seeded, those other small. Uh, they're a little slower to 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 develop. What's really interesting is, and, and Kevin got a really nice picture of this. This field, it's the same exact field. One part of the field had, didn't have manure applied after the second harvest. And this other side had manure applied to it. You can just see the, the effect that those nutrients had on that, that crop. It 
demands nutrients. It needs nitrogen to grow. So you really need to be feeding this crop to get uh, decent yields from that. As you can see, just a dramatic difference in the same field, same, same conditions, and the effect of the manure on that. So really important that you're managing nutrients appropriately for these, these cocktail mixes and sorghum sedan or sorghum forages in general. But you can see even in that third cut, they had really pretty good yields at this farm and they had applied enough manure after each cutting so they really got a big, big benefit from that manure on, at that farm. So as far as uh, on-farm yields go, big difference between these, uh, across these farms and different management. So a lot of the farms um, applied manure bef at, before the first cutting, so in between the cereal grain harvest and the planting, they apply manure and then they use commercial fertilizers in between. Farm three applied manure after each each cutting, so they saw a big benefit from using manure on that field. Um, it could be soil conditions as well. Farm three is in a little bit more sandy region as well, so those sorghum and sedan obviously probably benefit a little bit from those drier soils. So that's one thing to consider is your soil conditions too and what effect that, that has on it. Um, but you can see a, a pretty good variation but in general, we see about one to one and a half tons across these, these cuttings. Um, the blue bar is the cereal forage, so we saw about one to one and a half tons across those three farms that did harvest it. So pretty, pretty good harvest of cereal grain forage. The cocktail mix was about, oh, about three quarters to one and a half tons across most of the farms, across those three harvests. And then this last farm, this is marsh field, so we had a big first crop, and then about a little under one ton per acre for the second two cuttings as it got more into to the ryegrass. If you look at the, the forage quality, again, I, I talked about those cereal grain forages can be really exceptional forage quality, uh, right around 200 RFQ for those, those cereal grain forages, so exceptional uh, feed value for those. When we look at the cocktail mixes, uh, quite a bit lower, right around 120 to 150 at this farm, uh, about 100 to 150 at this farm. This farm with, that had the really high yields, they generally saw a little bit lower forage quality going on there. Um, and it's likely due to that higher yields, they're really diluting out that, um, having a, higher fiber, uh, more lignin, probably really driving down that, maybe decreasing that quality of that feed a little bit because of the higher yields. So the use, in the, the use of these alternative forages in the dairy, dairy diets really is depending upon what the quality is. And as I mentioned before, there's highly variable. So testing is really critical uh, of these, so sending samples into the lab is really important. Um, and for each cutting, so you wanna be testing each cutting throughout the season to make sure that you're allocating those um, to the right groups. As far as what we could use this in place for, mostly it's gonna be probably for other grasses or alfalfa or even probably other, maybe some other high fiber bry products. So you could replace some soybean hulls in the diet, some gluten feed possibly in the diet, um, <clears throat> just due to the fact that they have, most of these forages have really good fiber day stability. As far as in lactating cow diets, most of the energy is coming from that fiber pool. Um, so that can be a big benefit on some of these really high corn silage diets. Um, really driving that fiber digestibility is really important to fat tests. So you can really, uh, that can be a, a big advantage in some of these diets. The other thing to mention is that the, the sugar values on these can get exceptionally, like very high, especially sorghum forages in the fall. We can run 10, 15% sugars in these 
sorghum forages um, after a few frosts. So we can really get some really high sugar values and that can be really useful in these lactating cow diets as well. Um, one thing to mention is potassium on these forages. Uh, some of them get really high, like sorghum forages, cereal grain forages. They can all accumulate a lot of potassium, especially if we apply manure to them. So getting potassium, get a good mineral test on them is really critical if you're wanting to use in dry cow diets because that'll, that'll play a, a big role in how much your nutritionist is able to, to put in the diet. Um, so now we're gonna get into some, a couple uh, feeding studies we've done. So the first one we did last fall, last October, about a year ago, we started it. Uh, we were looking at, we had harvested some cocktail forage mix, uh, a senkunk cutting, so it was about a blend of, it was a good blend of the sorghum sedan and the, the ryegrass. And if we look at the, the quality of it compared to the corn silage and, and haylage, we were right around, around at a 15% protein mark. Uh, quite a bit of higher fiber, right around 48, 50% fiber. But our fiber was very digestible, about 61% compared to the alfalfa grass mix, uh, much lower uh, UNDF 240. So in all our TDN values were very similar to that alfalfa grass mix uh, due to that, that higher fiber edge stability. So in our diets, what we did was we, we fed the exact same diet. All we did was swap the cocktail mix for the, uh, the haylage mix. So we were just trying to, we were trying to see how that would impact production of those cows and intakes. So we, we fed those cows in these gates, so we keep track of individual intakes. Not a lot of fun to go in and scoop the feed out every day for the farm crew, but that's part of their job. They, so that's what we do. We, we feed them in these gates and then they, re, they measure the refusals back every day to, to do individual feed intakes. Which is, so I'm glad they, they do a really great job up in Marshfield doing that. Um, glad to have our crew that we do have. Um, so if we look at our diets, they were about 29% corn silage, 18% of either the alfalfa grass or the cocktail mixed silage. If we look at the nutrient content, about 26% NDF and 26% starch for the control, a little bit higher fiber for the cocktail mix and a little bit lower starch. When we look at intakes, really no difference in intakes across these two diets. So they ate all about six, 57 pounds of dry matter. Um, the raw milk production was uh, a bit higher for the control, but when we look at the fat content, the cocktail mix uh, fed cows had a little bit higher uh, fat content due to the, the, the greater fiber digestibility. So the fat yield was similar. The protein percent was actually a little bit higher on the cocktail mix diet, and so they produced similar amounts of protein and fat per day, and actually the same amount of solids corrected milk. So the amount of solids that were produced by these cows is pretty similar, just a little bit lower fluid milk volume from those animals. So really interesting, they're just getting energy instead of from starch, they're getting more of it from the fiber pool. So really. It just shows that you can, if you have really good fiber day stability forages, you can replace some of the starch in the diet and replace some of your other, uh, um, these other, uh, the alfalfa and grass, which have a little bit lower fiber day stability. You can replace those and basically swap out some of the nutrients for that. This work's been done at uh, Prairie du Sac as well, looking at Sudan grass. Uh, so again, a, a warm season annual, and they replaced it up from zero to 30% of the diet. Uh, they were replacing both corn silage and alfalfa silage, and they saw a, uh, as they increased the Sudan grass content of the diet, they did see a decrease in, in intakes due to the higher fiber amount, so they're filling the rumen up more, filling the digestive tract a little bit more. And they did see a reduction in milk production up to, um, but really no difference up to about 10% of the diet. So similar amounts of solids corrected milk up to about 
any more than that, you really start to see a, a decrease in milk production due to that higher fiber and, and lower intakes. So there's probably some limits to that, how much you can put into these forages and what impact on intake would be. If they probably, if they were to replace more of uh, haylage instead of corn silage, they might have saw a little bit different effect on, on that diet as well. So kind of have to work with your nutritionist and see what, how that's going to fit in your diet and what it might replace. What I really like to do with these sorghum forages is replace them in heifer diets, use it as a replacement for uh, corn silage and maybe some of the uh, other high fiber feeds, so hay or straw that you might use in, uh, in these heifer diets. So we did some work where we placed uh, like a really high fiber hay, basically straw, and some corn silage and a little bit of haylage in the diet, and we replaced them with sorghum sedan grass silage. So we basically got some higher fiber diets, so about 55% fiber, compared to almost 50% for the control. Similar proteins, actually very similar energy content, so the same, similar energy, about 60 to 61%. But this is huge. So we, de we were able to decrease their intakes by about four pounds a day by feeding that higher fiber diets. So it's four pounds of feed that you didn't have to pay for to put through that animal, for one thing. But the big thing that we like to see is that the, the growth of those animals was better, only about two pounds a day versus on the control diet, which is actually pretty reasonable according to the nutrient requirements based on our our guidelines, they were gaining almost two and a half pounds a day on that diet. These animals would get very fat very quickly on, that, on those diets if we left them on there for, for a, a longer period of time. So this is where these higher fiber forages really come in handy in heifer diets is the control feed intake and control growth. So just a bit of summary. So these, these forages can be really handy in the field to, to fill in spots. Um, they fit nicely in some rotations. Good use of uh, manure during the, during the season. Uh, they can be used in a, di a variety of different diets, whether cow diets, um, lactating, uh, lactating diets, dry cows, heifers. So they have a pretty versatile. One thing to consider is make sure you're testing. If you want to separate those feeds to use in certain diets, make sure you, you do that. You have separate storage or bags or or separate bunkers or piles. So if you really want to target use these. So I guess I took too much time. I see Dennis is out there walking around. So, but I guess we can take some questions. So I guess if you have any, anybody has questions, I can try to answer those. Any questions for Are you looking at the health Yeah, so we haven't looked at the health benefits yet. Um, we haven't done any long-term studies. That was only about a two-month study. But you could imagine, we do see benefits of feeding higher fiber diets on the rumen compared to a higher starch diet. So you see uh, improved fermentation, so lower acid levels, uh, lower acidosis issues, better feet. Uh, you should see better foot, foot health with higher fiber, higher fiber stability diets compared to a higher starch diet. So you, in, in theory, you should, you should be able to see improved cow health, especially in foot, foot and, and gut health with the higher fiber diets. So but as far as doing research on that, we haven't done that yet, so. But that's a, that's a, good, that's a good question and good thing to look at, so. Yeah, Mike, did you? So festioleum, yeah, I, I haven't worked those with those directly. Jason's been doing that, but what we what we have noticed, at least in our pasture work, is that we've seen those. They're about they'll be present for a couple years, and then they'll, at least in the pastures, they'll kind of disappear. They're more of a, a two to three two year uh, type of uh, a presence in the pastures, at least. So. Yeah, Italian ryegrass is about a, well, we manage as a one-year 
an annual, really, but. Yeah, I can't comment on that, I guess, too much, Mike. We didn't look at the different varieties. I think he had only tested one variety in his plots. But yeah, I, I could imagine if you have different combinations of the fescue and, and ryegrass in that, that you probably you would pick up maybe some different uh, persistence. Um, that's, that's something really of interesting, though. To, we just don't have a lot of data in Wisconsin on different well, there, there is some older data from, from Dan Understander where they looked at persistence, but um, I'm not sure about the different combinations of fescue and, and ryegrass, though. That's yeah, we haven't had any issues up there with me winter kill on meadow fescue. Um, we've had meadow fescue in our pastures for going on five years, and, and we've grazed that down to the ground with stockpiling, and it came back really nice the last two years, so we've actually had pretty good luck with that. Actually, we've had more of an issue with orchard grass thinning out in the pastures when we've intest intensively grazed it than with metal fescue. But. Yeah. Yeah, I can't comment on and we've had an issue, but maybe Kevin Kevin could comment, so Yeah, well, yeah one, one thing to consider is that this is plot data, too. They're not under field conditions, so that's where you'd probably, yeah. Yeah, yeah we, actually, the perennial rye is sustained pretty well in our plots, um, which you wouldn't expect that usually. Yeah, you just, we get a decent amount of winter cover, so yeah, probably snow cover makes a pretty, uh, and then we don't get a whole lot of ponding, at least in our, where we uh, have our plot work and pastures, so if you have uh, soil conditions where you get some some water that ponds in, in the end of winter, yeah, that's probably conditions where you probably get some winter kill, just like with alfalfa, so. Yeah, that's, I think any situation with alfalfa where you're going to get winter kill too, you're probably going to see some issues with grasses, so they're not, they're not impervious or they're not going to, they're not going to be able to do any better than alfalfa in those situations, I don't think. They're going to be just as susceptible, so, but yeah, that's, that's good, good point, Mike.
Yeah, yeah. For the for the cocktail mix, the they they're not super cheap to put in, and a, a, and the reason for it is I think when you're putting in nine pounds of legumes and you're not getting any benefit from those, at least from what we can see in our plot work and field work, we're just not seeing those come through even in, in the fall. In, in my mind, we could probably take those out in some of those mixes, at least from based on our work, that we're just not seeing that legumes come through and probably could take, think about taking those out and saving some seed costs as far as that. Because that's a... Yeah, so nitrogen-wise, we're putting on about 40 units, 40 pounds of nitrogen per, per harvest or per cutting. So 40 on at, at uh, planting and then 40 after each. So it's about 120 pounds of nitrogen per, uh, per acre. So yeah, you're, um, it is fairly substantial amount of nitrogen to, to apply if you're not using manure. So that's something to consider that, yeah, those nitrogen costs this year were pretty pretty rough buying buying commercial nitrogen so but uh, yeah I haven't looked at the production costs yet on those but yeah that's one thing to consider is nitrogen fertility on these grasses is gonna get kind of costly so if you don't have a manure to apply to them you got to kind of think about that and do you put a mixture of grasses and legumes and hopefully the legumes provide the nitrogen uh, credit to those grasses um, that works that work's been done pretty well in New York, and they've had pretty good success with, uh, with uh, putting legumes and with grasses. Um, they've had pretty good success with that. So, yeah, Kevin. Yeah, yeah we've, we're doing our second year. We've done work at Marshfield and over up in uh, Door County at the Peninsular site. And um, at both sites this year, we just haven't seen, we've seen a little bit of the vetch come in and then uh, very few plants of clovers come in, just pretty minimal this past year too. I think a lot of it has to do with the planting how we put it in. We need to make sure that the planter is set up or the drill is set up nice so that it's getting the right depth. Depth is really critical for those clovers if we plant them too deep. I think it's a, it's a disadvantage to them. But yeah. Yeah, yeah, I don't, that's good. I, we, we just don't even see them emerge, really. We don't see the, they don't, they don't even come up. I don't know if it's a planting issue, but um, they don't even, yeah, the competition. Yeah, the grass is, comes up so quickly, the, especially the sorghum sedan comes up, and within a few, uh, three or four weeks, that's canopied, so. It really can restricts the growth of those those clovers, and it restricts the the ryegrass. Until you get that sorghum sedan taken off, that ryegrass doesn't do very much, really. But um, but yeah, that's that's just what we've seen in our plots that we've. Um, but there's yeah, we've Kevin will touch on what he's seen this afternoon. So yeah, I, I yeah, but yeah. But yeah, it's really, those cocktail mixes are, they have their place, but sometimes they're frustrating, to be honest. Like, like they, the planting of them, get different species together, it, it, it can be a challenge to uh, get the depth correct. Um, it, it uh, you almost need to go shallower in my mind 
um, especially for those ryegrass and the, and the clovers, if you want those to come in, is to go a little bit shallower than deeper. So, so that's what we've been doing, is trying to look at different depths mainly of that. So and big, that's a, a big thing. We, at least we're, we're thinking that's a big reason why some of those small seeds aren't coming up very well. But, uh, all right. All right, we appreciate it. Thank you very much for coming. Thanks, Matt. Great presentation, a lot to think about there, and a good lead in to this afternoon's presentation from Kevin as well. Uh, if, as, as you go on the way out, see our booth over there to pick up a couple of these cards. On the back of the cards actually have links to the, to the websites where these videos will be located. So both for the Dairy Forge seminars here as well as our webinars that we do as a center, uh, those are posted up on the web as well, so you can access those. So again, thanks, Matt. Appreciate it very much, and look forward to seeing everyone this afternoon at 1.30.